it's really important to us to start looking at how to live a regenerative lifestyle. And with having more plants and with growing our own food, hopefully we're doing something right. Hopefully that means our greenery is creating healthier soil and, you know, attracting the animals that should be in this region and haven't been because of cars and overdevelopment. Hello and welcome to the Ultimate Health Podcast, episode 357. Jesse Chapp is here with Marnie Wasserman, and we are here to take your health to the next level. Each week, we will bring you inspiring and informative conversations about health and wellness, covering topics of nutrition, lifestyle, fitness, mindset, and so much more. And this week, we're speaking with Whitney Lee Morris. She's a small space lifestyle consultant based in Venice, California, and she's a firm believer that you don't need to live large to live beautifully. Whitney helps individuals, couples, and families live comfortably and contentedly in and with a smaller footprint. And her book is Small Space Style. And I'm always interested in learning to live more minimalistically and simply. And Whitney and I just had a great conversation. I know you're going to love this. Some of the highlights include Whitney living in a tiny 400 square foot cottage near the canals in Venice, California with her husband, son, and two dogs. Vertical gardening in small spaces living a conscious vegetarian lifestyle, finding freedom and balance working from home, and how ultimate health starts in the mind. We'd really appreciate it if you help spread the good word, share this episode with somebody in your life, and we thank you ahead of time. Without further ado, here we go with Whitney Lee Morris. Hello, Whitney. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to talk to you. Yeah, we're going to have a good time here, and I definitely follow your lifestyle on social media and dug through your blog and preparing for this interview. And there's a lot to talk about. And (laughs) let's start off talking about the obvious, which is the cottage that you and your family live in, which was built all the way back in 1924. So just a real history there and a really unique living space. And you've actually lived there since 2011. So take us back there and talk about where you're at in your life and how this opportunity came to be. Yeah. So nine years ago, I was living in a studio by the beach here in Venice. And my now husband, then boyfriend was living in Silver Lake, which if any listeners know LA, you'll know that's like a long distance relationship given LA traffic. So we knew we had to find a place together and we wanted to stay in Venice. You know, Venice prices even then are pretty exorbitant. And we knew we wanted to be in the canal neighborhood. It's such a unique neighborhood. Um, It's an ocean fed canal system just close to the beach here in Venice. And we knew we wanted to be in this neighborhood, but prices were sky high. And so we thought, well, let's look at non-traditional terms of where real estate's going in Venice. And so we found this tiny house and we weren't looking to live tiny. We just fell in love with this house. And frankly, because I was coming from a studio, it was a space upgrade for me, which is funny because it's under 400 square feet. But we just fell in love with this space because there's so much light and air. And that's why we're here in Venice, right? It's the natural beauty of this neighborhood and this community. So I ran a small creative firm, which I still, in essence, run, but it's evolved over the years. So I worked from home from the get-go. And Adam was working in digital advertising. And we just fell more and more in love with this home over time. And as I began sharing glimpses of it and the way that we were living on social media, people kept asking more and more questions. And over the years, as those questions turned into, well, started taking so, so much time, I realized that I was staying up nights to answer all these inquiries that were coming in and that it was becoming like my full-time job. So I just kind of molded it into my existing full-time job and transitioned to really answering people's questions full-time because it was clearly something that people wanted and needed and it was bringing me joy and it still continues to bring me joy. So I'm currently still a small space lifestyle consultant. That means, at least in my world, that means I not only work with individuals, I'm helping them troubleshoot from afar, whether it's individuals, families, couples to help them troubleshoot certain areas. But I also help outfit small spaces. I do that less and less these days as my environmental concerns have grown more and more. There is a design and decor element to it as well. And then I also consult with a lot of editorial and news outlets to kind of scratch the itch for delivering stories about small space living in this era. I mean, that takes a phenomenal amount of time too. So it's an unconventional, it's a strange job, but it's a wonderful job. And now my husband works for my company and works with me. And we have a almost four-year-old, I guess. He's three and a half years old, which where does time go? And two rescue beagles, and we're all in this space together. It's a live work space. 
and it's wonderful. And here we are. Well, it's definitely unconventional and I can relate as well. My wife and I, we have this podcast as our business and our passion and we get to work together as a couple as well. So it's just a lot of similarities there. Yeah, absolutely. And it's an interesting time during COVID as people are figuring out how to work from home. It's interesting to have already worked from home and to experience this change in a different way than a lot of people seem to be experiencing the change. Have there been any changes since COVID or do things look pretty much the same? You know, it's much like it sounds like for you and Marty, it's the same for us as it's been for the past few years. I will say that we generally go to our library a lot. We miss going to the library to get children's books in particular for our son. He loves reading. It's his favorite activity, I would say. And so we miss going to our library and enjoying our community resources. And we can't really walk around the canals because the sidewalks, they don't provide more than six feet. So if you're passing somebody, you're in such close proximity that they've asked that people, the community has asked for people to not walk around the canal. So we're, of course, missing that, especially because we have two dogs. So we take a lot of walks. So even though we're wearing our masks, we avoid that area to try and keep everyone in the community safe. West is in a part-time French group three times a week, and he hasn't obviously been able to go to that. And that is a time where we can get some of the work done more efficiently at the house. So that's been a little bit challenging, but not in a way that's upending. It just means that what we're used to four days of the week has now become seven days of the week. And it's a wonderful opportunity to just be closer to him. So it's really just required some shuffling on our end, but it's by no means an upheaval. Yeah, we're the same. Things have just pivoted slightly, but overall, same day in, day out. And are you guys living right on the canal? I know you have a canoe and that's part of the activities that you like to get outside and do. How far away is the canal from your actual home? We're set back, so we're probably a two-minute walk. So we're right in the neighborhood, but our house isn't on the front. So we don't share photos in front of our house anyway, just for privacy and security reasons. But also, we're in an enclosed area that doesn't open up immediately to the canals. We're just right next to it. So it actually works out better for us for privacy reasons, because the canals are so beautiful, and the homes and the architecture and the gardens are so, so beautiful. But they are not the most private place in the sense that the whole joy of having a home on the canals is to look out over the canals. But since it's also a big tourist destination, thoroughfare, it doesn't allow for a ton of privacy. So we actually are quite happy with the little di- bit of distance that we have, but it's still the sidewalk that we get to within just, you know, one or two minutes. So it's kind of the best of both worlds for us. And overall in Venice, is the tiny house movement really taking effect there? Or are you guys kind of outcasts in that world? It's going the other way. So actually, the canal system used to be three times the size, if I'm not mistaken, that it currently is. And then they filled in the canals shortly after they built them to allow for more cars because cars were becoming a thing. So they filled in the canals to make more roads. So there were a bunch of little waterside cottages everywhere in Venice. And in recent years, those have been knocked down for these zero lot line mega homes that are just like giant walls. And I don't mean to demonize those or or anything. It's just a lot of those homes don't really use the gardens and they don't keep the trees and everything. They build these giant two or three story homes. So we are kind of a dying (laughs) breed in terms of our house. They are getting knocked down right and left. And we anticipate the ones around us going probably pretty soon or being adjusted pretty soon. So for me, it's pretty heartbreaking. You know, everyone's got their own story and I'm sure lots of the new builds are probably more energy efficient in certain ways. I don't want to offend anybody, but for me, it's personally, it's just pretty heartbreaking because the houses that really embrace the access to light and air for everybody are few and far between now. And it's harder and harder for all homes to access light. We keep blocking each other out by building higher and higher and more and more. But do you have a small community, even a couple of their families that are living a similar lifestyle? Or are you truly alone in this? Yeah, I'm glad that you asked that. There are a couple. So there's actually two tiny houses on our property. So we have a wonderful neighbor. His name is Max. He's a delight. And so he's actually in a house that has an identical footprint as ours. It doesn't look the same on the inside, but it has an identical footprint. And he's on the property with us. And then our neighbors to one side of the fence Also, we're in an identical home and extended it a little bit. They built onto it a little bit. But I think originally it was four identical cottages. And then over the last almost 100 years, they've evolved and each one has been changed up. And one of them, I think, burnt down. And that's why our neighbors expanded their house a little bit because they had that extra property to do that, that extra space to do that. 
So we definitely have this very, very immediate community. But other than that, those are the only people with whom I'm closely acquainted that we deal with on a daily basis who live in tiny homes in our community. Didn't you guys buy up another home over time that was close to your original property? Yeah, so that's what we did shortly after West was born. The front house that our neighbor Max lives in, that house became available. There was a lovely man from Spain who was living there and was basically kind of like having a housemate because it's eight feet away from our house. It's divided by a shared porch. And we thought it would be a great opportunity to see if we needed more land and see if we needed more space. Sorry, I should say more square footage, more space. So we rented that house in tune, you know, maintaining our home to use it as a place for um, craft services for productions because we do a lot of shoots. We also turn the bedroom into like a full playroom and nursery kind of area. And then, of course, it was a little bungalow for my parents to stay in when they visit from Florida. But after renting it for six months, we realized that we didn't actually need the space. All we were using it for really was a playroom and nursery. And we realized that we could just use the porch that we already have to create that space that he needed. And around that age, when they're learning to walk and going from crawling really rapidly to really figuring out how to move those legs. And so we wanted the space for him to be able to go back and forth on the porch. So we just let go of that house. We didn't need the extra expense and we didn't need the extra inches. You know, and I think that if we were living someplace more rural, we probably wouldn't have taken over the house in the first place because the concern here is that although West can run around the canals, there's so many cars in Los Angeles and so many cars in our neighborhood that you can't just let your kid go without helicoptering around them, which is kind of sad. So that's why we really wanted to test out trying that front property. But we just didn't need it. So we went back to living in under 400 square feet plus the outdoor space. And that's worked well for us now for it's been like three years. Got it. So Max is now in that home. And Max is there. It's so great. It's hard to find somebody to live on a property with you that's like in such such close quarters. You know, it's like, especially as an adult, you know, it's not like I'm 39. It's not like when you're 20 and you're like, sure. You know, it's hard to find someone that you want to kind of share your life with that closely and he's delightful so the property allows for a lot of privacy we can go days without seeing each other but when it comes to things like the shared washer dryer the porch that connects our home you certainly want to be connected you know have a good relationship with the person who's living this close to you so we're very lucky most definitely and you mentioned your parents and how they're in florida and that's actually where you grew up so i want to go back there and talk about your life growing up and i know an interesting part of that was growing up on a wildlife preserve so take us back to being a kid and what that was like. Yeah, I mean, we, I grew up in Gainesville. We moved to that particular location when I was almost nine. And it's amazing. It's all this acreage. It's on this protected wildlife area. It's what you picture when you picture like Louisiana. It's like the live oaks with the dripping moss kind of like, or even Savannah, Georgia. Like it's that kind of terrain. So, you know, North Florida is just so beautiful with this mix of prairie and lakes, you know, forests. And it is just so, so beautiful. So growing up there was so special because we got to see all these endangered birds and we had alligators in the backyard. My parents still do. They sent me a picture the other day of an alligator just like at the front door. Literally, it was a really wonderful place to grow up, a place to run around and enjoy the air. And that was the activity. The activity was we were just outside all the time playing and relying on nature for entertainment and joy. So that's something that I think has really stuck with me. And my husband, Adam, is from the Miami area. So he's also really acquainted with Florida and he went to school in North Central Florida. So he's also really connected with that kind of train, even though we don't really want to live there right now. So hugely important to us. And I think that that's come into play in our home in the sense that we've really let the garden, the garden was just like a dead dry patch when we moved in. And it is now just like overrun with vines and plants and it breathes. And I think that that's because of where we came from. Yeah, it's just beautiful. You talked about your garden and the influence from where you came from. Talk more about when plants were intertwined in your life. Yeah, that's interesting. As an adult, I didn't really appreciate them until I experienced a lack of them. When I moved to New York City and was living there, I realized what I was missing. And I'd lived many places between Florida and New York, but it was really when I was there. And I very much love New York and I love living in New York, but it's when I was there that I was like, whoa, 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 this doesn't feel right to me. But it really wasn't until we moved to the cottage that I was able to reintroduce greenery into my life, or at least not to this extent, because I didn't have an outdoor space. I think this is the first home that I've had, like not an apartment. So I think it's the first home I've had in my adult life where I actually had a garden. 
So this is really something that we could bring into our home and bring into our garden because of the space. And also too, the, one of the joys of having a small space is that you can really kind of go all out with it if you want to, because it's not infinite. To make our garden feel so like it has its own heartbeat, to make it feel like that, it doesn't take much. You know, like if you were to take the number of plants and vines that we have and put them on a one acre property, the property would probably look fairly naked. But in our home, because it's so small, it's just kind of teeming with this plant life. So it was really fun to bring that back into my life because I realized how much I was missing it. And it's nice for West, I think, to grow up around it because, you know, like I said, he's three and a half and he hasn't asked to go anywhere in this whole time that we've been quarantined. And I think it's because he can step outside and do so many different things thanks to the little bit of the greenery that we have and the life that's out there. And you can watch the butterflies and watch the bees and plant things and so it definitely feels like the right time in our lives to have reintroduced that. You mentioned butterflies and bees, and I know your home is a really open concept. And, you know, you have, I'm sure the door is open and windows open. Yeah. So how do you maintain not letting all these critters infiltrate your home and, and take over the home? Yeah, it's funny. That's one of the questions we get the most often, like at least every day. And the thing that's kind of unsatisfying, I think, for a lot of people is that we have this huge heat, which is that we live in Southern California and there are just simply not as many bugs around here. I'm sure there are little pockets of exceptions. I don't want to like paint the whole area with that brush, the whole region with that brush. But in our home, like the doors and windows are always open. And, you know, we'll find some spiders in the house and get them out with a cup every now and then or something, you know, and every now and then a hummingbird will fly in and we have to hold them a plant to help get it onto the plant and get it back out the door because we have skylights. So they just kind of zoom into the skylights. But we just don't have the issues in a lot of other regions. Like I could never live this lifestyle, really have the windows and doors open like this in my childhood home in Florida. Like there would be snakes and all sorts of things in the house, lizards and everything. And we just don't have them here. At least we don't have them at our house. So it's just this great cheat. There just aren't as many things to come inside the house. Um, and when it comes to just like little flies and this and that, they find their way out. And honestly, they don't bother us. And we think you know, it's really important to us to start looking at how to live a regenerative lifestyle. And with having more plants and with growing around food, more bugs are going to show up when they do, instead of looking at it as a problem, we need to poison them and kill them and get them out of the house. Instead of thinking of it that way, we just try to get them out if we can and as safely as we can and just think, okay, hopefully we're doing something right. Hopefully that means our greenery is creating healthier soil and, you know, attracting the animals that should be in this region and haven't been because of cars and overdevelopment. Try and live in harmony as best you can with the minimal bugs that you're lucky enough to have given the environment. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now we're going to take a quick break from our chat with Whitney to give a shout out to our show partner, Thrive Market. Thrive has your favorite organic and non-GMO brands, plus guaranteed savings delivered right to your door. You'll shop over 6,000 wholesome food, home, and beauty products, and you can search by your diet and values such as paleo, vegan, keto, and gluten-free. Shopping at Thrive is good for you and good for the planet. They have carbon-neutral shipping, 100% recyclable packaging, and zero-waste warehouses. As a listener to UHP, you get 25% off your first order for a maximum $20 discount, and you get a free 30-day membership. To take advantage of this deal, all you need to do is go to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Thrive Market. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Thrive Market. And on top of that, you get fast and free shipping on orders over $49. Go and sign up with Thrive today. You're going to love what they have to offer. Now we're going to give a shout out to our other show partner, Perfect Keto. Perfect Keto bars are one of my go-to snacks. They only contain two or three grams of net carbs per bar and they have no artificial sweeteners, dairy, soy, corn fiber, or inflammatory vegetable oils. The bars contain collagen, which is great for your hair, skin, and nails, and they're portable and convenient, so they're great for travel, work, or before the gym. And also of great importance, they're delicious and satisfying. The Perfect Keto Bars come in six flavors, and chocolate chip cookie dough is my current favorite. And as a listener of our show, you get 20% off your Perfect Keto purchase by going to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash perfectketo. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash perfectketo. Perfect Keto products ship worldwide, and you get free shipping if you live in the U.S. Pick yourself up some of the Perfect Keto bars today. They make the perfect healthy snack. And now back to our chat with Whitney. 
So it sounds like you're growing some of your own food. Talk more about that. Yeah, I don't want to sound salesy, but I should say what it is because a lot of people ask. So we have two lettuce grow stands. And those are great for small spaces. I think they're great for any space, but they're great for small spaces because if I'm not mistaken, they take up about two square feet on the ground and then they go up about six feet. And each tower grows, I think, 32 or 36 plants. So we've got two of those. We're growing lettuce and strawberries and tomatoes and zucchini and cucumbers, also just herbs and things like that. Wasabi arugula, which I think is the most delicious thing ever growing sweet peas and everything. And it's crazy because you fill it up with water, you top it off once a week and can kind of play with the levels in the water once a week to make sure that the plants are getting all the nutrients that they need. But it requires so much less water than traditional growing does like in soil. So it's great if you live in a drought prone area as we do to use so much less water to grow so much food. So we're getting enough kale and we're getting so much lettuce that we can give it to our neighbors across the fence and give some to Max as well. And then we, as a family of three, are cooking three times a day, using this food in three meals a day, and there's still a ton. So we're growing our food that way with these lettuce grow towers. We also have uh, some raised bed planters. Wes really wanted to grow a pumpkin. He's been asking actually since he was old enough to talk. So we'll see how it goes because pumpkin needs a lot of space, but we're trying and more tomatoes and things like that. So we've got a little bit of a container garden as well as this vertical garden, which has been great because we have all the space we need for that, which is just remarkable to me. That's incredible. And do you guys have access to great farmer's markets in that area? Oh my gosh, we are so lucky. We are so, so lucky. So not only do we have access to wonderful farmer's markets, but also we have access to smaller grocery stores that also work with local farms we're just really lucky in Southern California to have that access. So, you know, we visited farms a couple of times and made friends with the people there and we love them. So it's amazing to know where eggs are coming from. For example, when we get our eggs, we're vegetarians. So, you know, we're getting produce boxes pretty regularly to supplement what we grow at home and the things that we can't grow at home. And we're getting them from local farms delivered through CSA boxes and whatnot. So it's been really remarkable to have access to fresh food. And that's something that we don't take for granted. And we need to make sure that food is accessible to more people because they're kind of these areas of the communities where it's a lot of packaged and processed foods. And I think that this is something that we should all have a right to. So I hope to be a part of in some capacity, getting that kind of food to all members of the community, because it shouldn't just be reserved for, you know, whoever happens to be in a certain area. And I know you have a cargo bike, and I'm assuming this is something you probably take to the farmer's markets and bring some of your food back in. But do you have a car as well? We do. We have an old 11-year-old Honda that we share. So we use one car. We got the cargo bike with the hope of not having to get a second car. And that was three years ago, and it's worked. And we got rid of the second car actually a long time ago, probably six years ago. But when we had Wes, we would need a car if Adam was at work we would need a car to get the dogs to the vet or something. We wanted to avoid having to get another car. So we got the cargo bike and the cargo bike is fantastic because it can actually fit both of our dogs West and another little one. So if we have another child or, you know, when his cousins are visiting or his friends are visiting, we can get two kids and and both dogs in the cargo bike, which is pretty amazing. (laughs) And it has an electric assist. So we can get up the hills of the bridges on the canals and just kind of the trickier areas with all the weight of the bike and everyone who's on it and in it. The cargo assist helps us and it's just a rechargeable battery. It's a great thing to take to the farmer's markets and to the library to load up with books and places like that. That sounds like a lot of fun. And you mentioned you and your family are on a vegetarian diet. Talk more about that. How long has that been? And was that decision made for ethical reasons, environmental, or or what made you go that way? Yeah, it was for both, both for how animals are treated, also for huge environmental concerns. So we transitioned into being vegetarians, I think, two years ago. I'd done it for years when I was younger, but I didn't do it the right way. I wasn't eating the right foods. Anyway, so we've been doing it now for two years. We've never felt better. We don't at all feel limited. We don't even think about eating meat anymore. And yeah, and Adam has continued to come up with new recipes or at least finding recipes to work with that use seasonal and regional produce and food so that we can eat a little more locally or a lot more locally and seasonally to hopefully reduce our environmental footprint, our negative environmental footprint as well. 
when the kid won't eat vegetables that we put him in the blender and magic some way to <laughs> get him to drink his vegetables. And so far, so good. And what's it like for your husband working in a tiny kitchen? Is there any limitations there or he feels like he's got space to be creative and do his thing? Yeah, I actually asked him that the other day and we'll joke like because it's a kitchen. Everybody gravitates to the kitchen, right? So and we have two beagles, so they're constantly in the kitchen. I'm 5'11", Adam's like 6'2". And then we've got these two 40 pound dogs and then our child. And so we're all crammed in this kitchen and there'll be times where Adam and I will joke and we'll just say under our breath, you know, we need a bigger house. But it is a true joke because it's just this dance that we do in the kitchen and one person moves here and the other person moves there. And it's at this point really natural. He said he has all the room that he needs. We basically, we got an electric cooktop in switch out our gas cooktop. And the reason we did that is because in a small space, it helps to have that extra surface space to use. And while we could use it when we had a gas cooktop by um, using over the burner cutting boards, it has been much easier to put the burner space into use into our tiny kitchen when we're not cooking or actually prep- prepping the food and whatnot. It's helped and it's given us some more surface space. Similarly, we do have a space for prep. We have a breakfast counter where we all sit and eat our meals. And that counter, when no one's sitting there, is completely prep space. So it doesn't feel like a tiny kitchen. It feels like a small kitchen, but I think it's all the space that he needs and so far so good. So, you know, but it does require, you know, we put away our dishes, we dry them and put them away right after we clean them. We do have a dishwasher. We try not to use it that often. Things like that so that we just don't have a lot of clutter. And we put small appliances. We have very few small appliances, but we put them away into the cabinets when we're not using them. And again, that just increases our surface space. Throughout our chat, I'm sure the listeners have a general idea of what your space looks like, but kind of take us through what the house is like, a little bit of a walkthrough. I know it's audio and it's not easy to do, but give us an idea of what the living space is like and what even the outdoor space is like. So when you walk onto our part of the property, you're immediately greeted by this shared porch to the right and then our front stoop. And the front stoop leads into the main room of the house, which includes the kitchen, but before you, the kitchen's towards the back. So before you get there, it's the living space. And in our case, in this small home, the living space also serves as an area for Wes to play, an area for me to do my work and my photo shoots, a pop-up dining space if we have guests over or it's a special occasion. It's also our son's bedroom at night because we have his dedicated set of sheets that we can put onto the built-in sofa and make that into actually bigger than a single bed. And also, obviously, the place where our guests stay when they come to visit and then Wes sleeps with us. And we've had guests, of course, it's usually one or two nights, but we've had guests for up to three weeks if they're visiting from abroad. So it's the little room that could. (laughs) And then after that room is our kitchen. The room, it really feels so much bigger thanks to a big skylight, a generous skylight overhead, and then a Dutch door in the kitchen, as well as these custom French doors that lead into the main room from the stoop, and then sets of windows. In addition to those, the doors are all windowed. So it really feels much, much bigger than it is. You realize how small it is when you get several bodies in there, like we got married there, and you realize how small it is when there are multiple people in there, or if you do something seemingly mundane, but it's not terribly mundane in a small house, which is like putting down a handbag or putting down a box that came in the mail and you put it down in the house and it is like taking up a ton of space because there really isn't that much space, but it's just visually so much bigger. It's a pretty small room, but it's the room that could, and it just does so much. And then the remaining two fifths of the house is the bedroom and a bathroom. And the bathroom, I don't show that often, not because it's actually quite cute, but it's got weird angles and or tough angles with respect to shooting. And it's pretty dark in there, but it's got a full-size shower and it's more than enough room, tons of storage space. We have a lot of reusable goods in there, so we don't need to store backup packs of Q-tips and cotton balls and things like that. So we really don't need that much space, but it has more than enough space for storage. And then we have pocket doors that lead to and from the bathroom. And then you can walk back out into the main room and just kind of circle, like do a little U-turn and you're in the bedroom through another pocket door. You're in the bedroom and the bedroom has a built-in bookshelf around it that's got drawers as well. So it doubles as storage for smaller accessories and whatnot. It's a bed and a storage space and a bookshelf and drawer system. And then we have one little closet that we all share. And that closet, we actually converted into a nursery for the first year of West's life. And it was a really precious little closet nursery. And I miss it. Now it is back to being a closet. And then you can step out of French doors from the bedroom. 
and you're in the back garden and the back garden has a custom sofa with mirrored panels attached to the back to enhance the visual space and bounce light around. Sofa's eight feet long. So it's great for us tall folks because we can just lounge out on it and the whole family can fit on it, which is fantastic. And then we also have a little outdoor shower tucked up into the vines overhead because we have an overhead vine canopy that we grew. And then connecting the back to the front stoop is a little shared thoroughfare that is part of our garden that we share with neighbor Max. And we've got a little basketball net up there for West and some gardening supplies. And then on that that porch, when you first walk in or when you're leaving, um, on that porch, it's an eight-foot wide porch, and that's where we keep our grow towers and our little grow station and another little outdoor sofa. And we use that area a lot. So yeah, it's more space than we need. It's perfect for us. I'm sure some people will go crazy there, but it's perfect for us. So earlier you mentioned when you guys moved in, the plant situation was pretty dismal. What was the house situation and how much work have you guys done yourselves to get it to where it is today? Yeah, the house is really beautiful. The built-ins were actually done decades ago by a woman who had her first child there and had two dogs as well. So she and I connected and we joked that there was something in the floorboards, this kind of family formula living in this house. And she had lived on a boat. And so the boat inspired her. She can really tell. I feel like a lot of small spaces are designed very cleverly, but in terms of like features, but perhaps they're not the best when you're actually in there navigating day-to-day life. And this space is created with so much intention and with so much knowledge of how one would navigate the space. That's what makes it so, so special. So what we've done really is we made a lot of aesthetic changes that we think have visually enlarged the space and helped it kind of blend more into the Southern California style. So we added tiling and, you know, hand-painted tile in the kitchen, switched out the appliances. They were really dark stainless steel and black appliances that your eye just kind of gravitated towards, just kind of sucked some of the light out of the space. It was a little jarring because everything else we painted really light and bright. So we put in some white appliances there, which again, helps bounce the light around. And we did some work with the existing built-ins to really maximize the space a little bit more and then also conceal things a little bit better because you really just don't want to look at everything all the time because that's what makes a space feel cluttered, I think. And then we really just overhauled the back and the porch so much. Like the porch is a little smaller and had this giant water heater outside. So we got a tankless one to kind of tuck away. And we were able to enlarge the surface space of the porch without expanding the actual footprint, you know, of course, of the house or the property. So we were just able to extend the porch and with the garden. I don't know when it happened, but it was just kind of hacked back and left to die. (laughs) And so really, the garden is pretty unrecognizable now which it took effort, but it wasn't crazy effort. We worked with plants that are drought tolerant and stuff. So we just kind of put them in and let them do what they naturally do and let them take over, which has been great. And like I said, we converted the, the closet into a nursery and then back again. And we've done some other little silly things like covered our heater, our wall heater in a safe way and use a Dyson instead to manage the house, the heating and cooling in the house when necessary. And some little things like that that have made a real big difference. And how do you guys go about not accumulating stuff? Is it simply a fact that there's only this much space to work with and we just can't? Or I know you came from a relatively small space before moving into this. So is it something, you know, a habit you've built throughout your life just not to accumulate? Or what does that look like? Yeah. So for me personally, so I was in a really long term relationship with a lovely person, but we moved into this big apartment in Charlotte. And I feel like I kind of let the idea of really creating a house to kind of like then create the memories got away with me. And I started looking at everything online, what I wanted to bring into the house. And we need this dining set because that's where our kids are going to sit. And that's where we're going to, you know, and just kind of making up these stories that didn't really exist yet and trying to design for those stories. And in doing so, I just accumulated all this crap that I really didn't need and not to even mention the environmental footprint and toll of all that stuff. When that relationship ended and I moved to my studio, I left pretty much everything in North Carolina and really wanted to focus on not necessarily minimalism, but just really mindfully working with the life that I currently have and what brings me joy in this moment and really cultivating that and how that translates to acquiring or not acquiring certain things. So now that's a philosophy or that's a mindset that I'm always thinking of or situation that I'm always kind of keeping in the back of my mind, you know, not to let stuff run away with my life. But then also we apply certain rules to what we bring into the house. So now we ask ourselves, and of course there are exceptions. Of course you don't get it right every time. But if we bring something into the house, we ask, can it multitask? Can it play more than one role? Where are we going to store it when it's not in use? How often are we going to use it? Is this something that we could rent or borrow from a neighbor? How often do we actually need it? 
was it made ethically? Was it made with sustainable materials? Is it going to rot on this planet till the end of time? Or is it actually going to break down? We ask ourselves all these questions before we bring something into the house. And that really has helped us keep our number of possessions at bay. And then also when we do bring something into the house, we try to let two things go in its place. When we find a dedicated place to donate it also, by the way, because like 80 something percent of donations just end up in landfills. So we really try to find a nonprofit or an individual who could use the items that we're giving away. But those rules have really helped us not accumulate too much stuff. And it's amazing because the less stuff you have, then the fewer organizing systems you need to house those things. So I know that lots of people look at those like really organized pantries or closets with all those plastic boxes where everything is like neat and, you know, and has a home. And that's great. But for me, I look at those things and see all the plastic there that's going to sit here for forever. And I see things like so many things that then needed a home once they got into the house, like they needed a dedicated home. And then you had to buy another thing to house that first thing. And I'd really just try to avoid that as much as possible by repurposing and upcycling. And and the repurposing and upcycling has helped us then acquire fewer belongings. We're a work in progress. We're always trying to live by our own rules and do better. But that has really helped us with respect to clutter. Now we're going to take another quick break from our chat with Whitney to give a shout out to our show partner, Blue Blocks. If you're looking to block the junk light from your eyes, Blue Blocks has you covered. They offer three different lenses, one for evening and nighttime use before bed, and two that are designed to block junk light from poor lighting and electronic devices during the daytime. They offer stylish frames for kids and adults and have lenses to accommodate everyone. The three lens options are magnification, prescription, and non-prescription. If you're new to blue light glasses, I'd recommend starting with the Sleep Plus glasses with their signature blue and green light blocking lenses, and these are for wearing two to three hours before bed and will have a positive impact on your sleep, recovery, and balancing your hormones. And as a listener of our show, you get 15% off your Blue Blocks purchase by going to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash blueblocks. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash blueblocks. And Blue Blocks is spelled B-L-U-B-L-O-X. They also offer free shipping worldwide on orders over $100. Go shop at Blue Blocks today and get yourself a pair of the world's most advanced blue light glasses. Now we're going to give a shout out to our other show partner, Organifi. The Organifi green juice powder is filled with immune boosting superfoods and is a staple in our home. To use it, all you need to do is take a scoop and stir or shake it into about 8 or 10 ounces of water and you're good to go in under a minute. The ingredients include moringa, chlorella, mint, spirulina, beets, matcha green tea, wheatgrass, ashwagandha, and turmeric. The green juice along with all the other Organifi products are organic. They're gluten-free, soy-free, vegan, and keto-friendly. And as a listener of our show, you get 20% off your order by going to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Organifi. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Organifi. And Organifi is spelled O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I. Fuel your immunity today with the green juice from Organifi. And now back to our chat with Whitney. Talk about the mental aspect because you've gone to both ends of the spectrum. You talked about before buying and accumulating and having a different mindset about everything. When you moved to this space and started to live a more minimalistic lifestyle, what did that do to your mental health and how did that feel? Oh, it's amazing. <laughs> it's really amazing. I wasn't looking for it. We just fell in love with this house. So my studio, you know, that was perfect for that phase of my life. But it's just very freeing because life is chaotic as it is without all of our stuff taken into account. There is so much going on in this world that is so heavy and hard to deal with. And with those issues come a lot of work that a lot of people need to do to make sure that we fix what's going wrong right now. And so that takes a huge toll on you. And then also, and it should, but also the consumption of news and even just social media, the way that we take in information now, it's just so relentless. Anything that we can do to help ease that onslaught of information is helpful. And for me, that comes into play with minimizing the amount of stuff that we have in our house that we then have to take care of on top of taking care of everything else that's going on within our bodies, within our world, within our communities. For me, it's been very freeing because it's allowed me, the time that I get back from not having to tend to my house or the stuff within it allows me to be with my son more, which is great because I'm between me and Adam, I'm the one who's working full time. So 
even though my son is mere feet from me, he's there and I don't really feel like I'm seeing him sometimes. And that's just what happens when you work. I am very proud of the fact that I'm able to feed my family as a female creative business owner. I'm, I'm very happy with that. But it is hard also as a parent, not even just as a mother, but as a parent to be like, I'm right next to my kid and I'm not giving them the attention that they deserve. So by having a home that I can manage in a more minimal, even though we're not minimalists, a more minimal home, I can then take that extra energy when I'm not working and really focus it on my son, on my marriage, on my dogs who I love, like they are people to me. And that's what it gives to me. It's really living with less in order to live with more. And that's truly how I feel about it. And also it allows me to spend my time instead of going out and shopping or whatever by using reusable goods and just acquiring fewer goods in the first place. I can then work with nonprofits and organizations that I really care about and believe in. And those are minutes that I think I wouldn't have because I would be tending to all these other responsibilities in my day-to-day life and I wouldn't get to do those things. And so by cutting out that superfluous stuff, I can then really focus my attention and energy on things that I believe are really deserving of it as opposed to more material possessions. Do you find yourself ever getting caught up in the rat race where as you become more successful and finances are flowing in and different opportunities arise, do you ever have to catch yourself and pull yourself back in and say, you know, I don't want to go there. This isn't my goal. And I'm happy where I'm at. Constantly, but not in a bad way. Part of the trick, right, is that a lot of our income is tied to advertising. So if I don't actually want people to buy things, if I don't actually really want to use affiliate links, because I don't want people accumulating things they don't need, then how do I advertise and earn the income for my family? Because frankly, let's face it, like I am, of course, I'm paid for lots of my consulting and whatnot, but I can't bill a news organization for the time that I'm spending with them. They don't pay people. I can't bill people who are asking me questions on Instagram for answering their one question, but you add those questions up and it takes so much time. And I'm sure you know this too, but it's just, it takes hours and days and it is a true full-time job, which is great. I love it. But then I have to supplement that free labor, right? And I have to make some money off of it. So I'm advertising certain products on my blog and on my Instagram. So really what I've tried to do is transition as much as possible to services or edible goods, reusable goods, and really try to make sure that whatever I'm promoting is something that is in line with living with less. It's not part of the latest trend because that's part of the cycle that's really harming our planet. I really try to focus as much as possible on things that I really think align with my values. Again, I don't get it right 100% of the time. Sometimes there is some partnership where part of it is amazing and it's totally worth sharing because I think that our community is really going to enjoy it. But then there is some kind of negative element somewhere and it's really hard to get everything 100% right for a job that can actually pay the bills. But we try and we try really, really, really hard because it's personal. This job is not just a job. I don't just clock in. This is my life. This is my everything. This is my family. So we really try to not get caught up in it as much as possible. We also have to, when it comes to content creation, I really just do what's natural for us. I have more photos than I share because I already show people the same space again and again. I don't want to do it six times a day because I don't want to totally exhaust them. But I have more photos than I can share because this is actually really what brings me joy. And so what I just do is talk about that, talk about not wanting to be in the rat race and just communicate that with our readership and with our community and just say, you know, like, you're not going to see a new angle on here every day. And you're not going to see a new item on here every day that you can go and buy. And you can't buy this coffee table because it's vintage. And that's kind of the point, right? That's kind of the point. It's like, we want you to live with less. We want you to make your own creative space that brings you joy. We want you to live with the lighter footprint. If those are things that you are interested in, we want to show you ways in which it can be done. And we want to be an example, just share real life so you can see how it's being done. If that's something that's of interest to you. I feel really passionate about that and about not getting caught up in it while also, of course, maintaining sound business practices that continue to help my business and pay our bills and put food on the table. That all makes sense. And what about you on a personal level, though, as you become more successful and you might want to upgrade your canoe and get another boat or get a better place or upgrade this? Like, How do you avoid getting caught up in consumption and the rat race of upgrading and buying things as you become more successful? You know, that actually isn't a problem for me. If I really want something, I'm going to go after it. And I don't feel like I need to justify that to anyone, you know, or if I do, I will write a post about it. Like I wrote a post when we acquired the second house for those six months or however long it was. I wrote a post about it like, hey, 
I hope this doesn't disappoint you guys. We're trying it out. We're seeing if it works. And then it, we didn't need it. So we went back and I wrote a post both times to just kind of explain my feelings because it was healthy for me. And I thought it would be helpful to our readership. So, you know, I, if I want something, I'm going to go after it and I'm not going to like flog myself over every little thing, you know, like we're not zero waste. There are things that we're striving for, but we're also not set up in a society that's really, that really makes that easy for people and not be easy, but it's, it's very, very hard to truly live zero waste. And we live in a major city. So we just try to do the best that we can. And one day when we want to move or we need to move for some reason, we're going to do it. And that's okay. Like, I hope that, and I believe that our community will be pretty respectful of it because it's real life and people gravitate towards authenticity and it's part of the story, right? It's all part of it. And it's just not in me to, to kind of keep up with the Joneses anyway. Like, I just don't care. Like I said, we have an 11 year old on this fit and I'm like, I'm fine with that. But we live in Los Angeles where there are Teslas everywhere and it could be very easy to let the psychology of it kind of get you down if you really are striving for like the typical American dream, but that's just not my dream. And so it's not that hard for me to say, you know, what? I don't actually need that. I'm not interested in this thousand dollar purse. If you are, that's great. That's just not me. And so it hasn't really been hard for me to, you know, I haven't had to like deny anything within myself, if that makes sense. We go for what we want to go for and it's some trial and error, but it's real. Yeah. But I think it takes some conscious effort to live that way because Marnie and I, in a lot of ways, have really simplified our life. And lifestyle creep is a real thing. When you start becoming more successful and have more cash flow, you know, there's different opportunities and a lot of nice things out there that can be enticing. And I think you really need to consciously think about it and consciously make decisions on what physical possessions you bring into your life. Yeah, no, it's true. And it's really just being mindful about everything, right? Why do you want it? And just kind of all the questions that you can go through before you acquire something or go after something. But yeah, I mean, I can see that for sure. And what's it like for you guys when you go, say, back to Florida and stay with your parents if you're visiting or when you're traveling and you're in these different spaces and all of a sudden space opens up and you have more space than you typically do back at your home? Do you start to kind of feel like you are maybe missing that a little bit day to day? Or is it like, no, this is reassuring that the lifestyle we're living and living smaller is right for us? I love that question. We really don't want more space right now. We would very much like land and we wish we had a fireplace. So those are the things, you know, it's not like we have everything that we could ever dream of. Like we do think about those things, of course. But when we go to visit other spaces, we really enjoy them for what they are. But frankly, it's always kind of nice to come home. I will say that we went and stayed at an Airbnb shortly before the COVID outbreak hit the States. And that house wasn't tiny, but it was minimal and it was designed to let the outdoors in. It was just a two bedroom, two bath. That space I really loved because it was just a mindfully created home that used the materials from the surrounding area and it blended into the hillside on which it sat. I think it just had just everything you need to live a comfortable life in that region. And I very much like that house. And I would say it was 1,200 square feet, 1,000 square feet, maybe 1,000 square feet. It was still much smaller than the average American home, which is like 2,600 square feet. It was this space, not the size of this space, if that makes sense. So similar to the reason why we fell in love with our house, it was the space, not the square footage of it. So we did really, really like that house. For us, it's always just fun to come home and be like back in our space because it's what we love. But it's always just an adventure to be in another size space. Like I've actually lived in a castle in France and like, we go there and visit there. And it's crazy. I made a series on the blog that was like, that was called From Cottage to Castle because it's this place that I bounce back and forth to for work. And it's always an adventure. And I love that. But we've chosen this home because it's what works for us. Wow. So how often are you getting out to the castle? Yeah, we've been three years, which is one of the longest stretches I've gone. But I've gone back and forth for 15 years. And I've lived there for up to like four months at a time. Where I'll have to get a visa and everything to stay there. So it's been three years and we were hoping to actually go back now, which clearly is not going to happen because of COVID. But yeah, I mean, that's such a joy, that area. And I love visiting it. We're even looking at the possibility of having a tiny house there. Who knows what will happen, but it's a region that calls to me. It's really beautiful. And again, it's an area where you can live in a smaller space because the outfit is so gorgeous. You can just enjoy that. And what do you do for work when you're there? I used to, I don't anymore, but I used to help this company with their museum exhibition design and just kind of marketing of the space. That was a thing that I did in my previous professional life where I worked a lot with museums and galleries. 
so since I worked with them for so long, that relationship evolved as my profession evolved, my job evolved, and then helping them with kind of marketing and PR more towards the end than the actual physical space. But yeah, it was a really fun job. I'm glad to be tethered to that region, both through my relationships and just from the heart. And as a mother, wife, entrepreneur, I'm sure every day is a little bit different, but can you take us through what a typical day would look like at home? Yeah, I'm curious what your day-to-day looks like. Um, I'm happy to share too. I want to hear it. So for us, we wake up early. So we have the skylight over the bed, which when we first moved in, we're like, oh, this is going to get annoying. And I actually really love it now. We wake up with the sun and also our headboard is windowed. So there's a lot of light in there. I'll get up at like 6.30 to 7.30, somewhere around there. And, you know, I feed the dogs and West and make coffee for the family and Adam makes smoothies for the family. And we'll just kind of take it slow in the morning, maybe listen to an audio book for West or NPR. And then we walk the dogs. And right now, because West is not terribly comfortable wearing a mask, we put him in this little wagon that has a little rooftop to it. So it's a little bit enclosed. We'll walk the dogs. And we used to walk around the canals, but like I said, we're just avoiding that area right now. And then I come back and make sure that I'm dressed like I would be for an office job because it just kind of helps me get in the mood to work and I'll work as long as I need to. And usually it's a full work day. And if I don't get everything done because I'm enjoying time with West or just dealing with realities of life, I will then stay up and work into the night. But Adam and I will switch off throughout the day with responsibilities, kind of give him a break and let him either work in the kitchen or do a little bit of exercise or whatever he needs to do. And maybe something for, for my business. Some, he helps me do accounting because I'm as awful with numbers as I am in the kitchen. And then I'll watch West and then, you know, we'll swap out and I do a lot of the creative work and the writing. And then we really regroup for an early dinner. We're like, we're like retired folk. We eat crazy early at like six o'clock and then West inevitably wants to have some kind of dance party or something in the living room. And we play with the dogs outside and turn on all the twinkle lights. And then, you know, he falls asleep with the sun. You know, right now it's around like eight o'clock. He'll fall asleep with the sun. And it's this really sweet, natural rhythm for us. When I was writing my book, it was way, 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 way more chaotic and involved 24-hour diners and breastfeeding around the clock and all sorts of ridiculousness. But that was a joy for that amount of time too, because, you know, it's always changing. But right now it's a very slow rhythm, but with a lot of components within it that kind of make it feel chaotic the way that like with a child and running a business can feel. And I'm sure you probably have a similar experience, but I would love to know. Yeah. I mean, our life has taken a dramatic shift. It was three and a half months ago. I was telling you before we jumped on the call that we had our first child, Sorel. So we're lucky enough that our lifestyle, we both work from home. So things didn't shift too much, but I typically get up before Marnie and and Marnie and baby typically do a, a morning feed at that time. I'll get up, I'd say around seven in the morning on average. They'll typically go to bed for a little bit after that. They'll do the feed and then have another rest. I have a slower start to the day. I have all kinds of different stuff I'll do in the morning. And then they'll get up, we'll all have breakfast together. And typically it's like a smoothie or smoothie bowl. I've already had my morning coffee by that point. And then I'll shower at that point usually and then get into the work day. And we're lucky enough because over time, my career before I was a chiropractor and I'd go into practice and I'd work in a brick and mortar and Marnie had a cooking school. So she worked and had a brick and mortar business as well. And we've evolved over time with this podcast to be able to work from home and and do this show, which we're both so passionate about. So after my shower, I'll jump into work and Marnie will spend the day taking care of baby and being present for the whole experience. And I'll often take breaks and just spend time with them, which is super nice because we can make up our own schedule and we get walks in throughout the day. We all have dinner together at night. We have a dog as well. So we take the dog for a walk and every day is a little bit different. And because we're in Ontario, we have four distinct seasons. So right now we're moving from spring into summer and and we didn't really get much of a spring. It's happened quite quickly and the weather's getting hot and I'm getting out in the garden and taking care of a lot of yard work. And I'm actually able to work on my laptop a good part of the day when I'm not doing the interviews, working outside, which is great. That's so nice. Reading books, preparing for interviews, answering emails and stuff on my computer outside. And I spend a lot of my week preparing for these interviews. I go in depth and do a lot of research so I can make sure and cover a lot of new material with each and every guest. So it's hard to give a typical day, but that gives a broad overview. We're really lucky. We have a lot of freedom, a lot of gratitude for everything in our life. We work really hard and we love it. 
So it sounds very similar. I love that. I love the idea of you working out in the garden too on your computer because you can kind of camera out being outside and self nurturing yourself that way and then also taking care of business at the same time. Yeah, and it's nice to be able to switch back and forth. I'll be working on my laptop for a couple hours and then I'll go water the gardens and play with the dog and go and spend some time with Sorel and Marnie and it's a lot of work and it's a lot of gray area. There's not a lot of, and this is something I need to work on long term where it gets to a certain point in the day, a certain time, and then everything shuts down and it's, you know, works away for the day and it's, it's family time. There's a lot of freedom that you're hearing, but oftentimes, and, and you can probably relate to this too, as an online entrepreneur in the evenings and stuff, it's easy to slip back to the computer and answer a few emails and jump on social media And I don't necessarily see that as a bad thing because there is so much freedom and I love what I do, but you always do have to check in and make sure you're keeping that balance. Yeah, I absolutely agree. It is a great thing to be able to do, but then sometimes you can feel like your life is getting away with you if you're working on into the night. But I I feel, I don't know about you, but I felt like COVID has been a nice balance check for me because since so many people have had to deal with such transition in their workspaces or in their work routines, it's kind of shuffled up the timeframes that people generally were using and expecting for hearing back from emails and voicemails. And I feel like communication kind of has reset itself in a way. And the immediacy has been, the brakes have been pumped a little bit with it. I don't know about you, but I felt like at night less pressure to keep up with the administrative part of things because I know that everyone else's schedules are a little bit shuffled up at this time too. And I'm hoping that's something that sticks with me. I don't know if you've had a similar experience, but I've definitely been able to separate a little bit from work at night. Oh, that's great. Not specifically in my case, but that does make a lot of sense. Yeah. (laughs) I got to keep working at it. But Whitney, I know we're coming up on time here. One final question for you. What does ultimate health mean to you? Oh, I think it starts psychologically, right? For me, ultimate health sounds like something that once we're in this mindset where we feel the freedoms to work with our bodies and work with our families and work in a way that once everything can align from from the mind down, I think that that's ultimate health to me. Um, It does no good for me if I get my body in shape, but my mind is a mess. But I feel like once my mind is a little bit more in order and I'm taking care of that and in keeping my brain in check and keeping my head sane, that I can then work on my body and work on keeping my family healthier as well. So for me, that's what it means or that's where it starts at least. That makes a lot of sense. The mind's a foundation for everything else. Yeah. And it's all connected. Yeah, absolutely it is. So other than the listeners getting a copy of your book, Small Space Style, how can they connect with you after the show? Thank you. Um, Yes, my Instagram handle is at Whitney Lee Morris, and Lee is spelled L-E-I-G-H. My Pinterest handle is the same. And my blog is tinycanalcottage.com. All right, we're going to link everything up in the show notes. Is Lee your middle name or is your first name Whitney Lee? It's actually my middle name. Everyone thinks it's my maiden name, but but yeah, it's my middle name. And I just kept my name as is when I got married. Because not only is it my business, but it is my name that my parents gave me and I, I cherish it. So, um, so yeah, so it's just my middle name. Beautiful. Marnie did the same thing. I love that. I love it. All right, Whitney, really enjoyed our conversation. A lot of fun. We brought up a lot of great stuff and I know the listeners are going to love it. So thank you. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Thank you for inviting me on. And thank you to all your listeners as well. Thank you. I really enjoyed that conversation with Whitney and I hope you did too. And we'd love to hear what you took away from the episode. Maybe it's something about living your life more simply or living more minimalistic. Let us know over on Instagram. You can tag Whitney Lee Morris and at Ultimate Health Podcast and take a screenshot of the player of yourself listening. You can even do a short video clip. And we'd love to hear from you over there. For full show notes, be sure and head over to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash 357. We have links there to everything we discussed today in a show summary, so be sure and check that out. And before we let you go, I want to give some love to our editor and engineer, Jace Sanderson over at podcasttech.com. Jace, thank you for all the hard work you put in. It's much appreciated. And this week's fun fact about Jace is that him and his wife recently had a crazy storm where they live in Prague. And the rain was heavy and they came close to getting hit by lightning. Actually, lightning struck the other side of the building, but luckily no one was injured, but it was crazy and it was loud. Happy to hear everyone safe and sound, Jace. Have an awesome week. We'll talk soon. Wishing you ultimate health.